Good evening, and thank you for joining us as we continue our journey through the story of the Bible. To do this, we have been looking at the 17 time periods of the Bible. I have those on the screen now, and we've worked through the first four of these, and today we want to look at number five, the Exodus from Egypt, and we'll just cover really the first 19 chapters of the book of Exodus, leave the law sections uh, to the next time period, and we understand the importance of the Exodus as it's going to be a theme throughout the rest of Scripture. You're going to see new references uh, to it constantly, and then even in the New Testament, uh, Jesus is often presented as the, the new Moses, and so it is an important thing, and to help us go through this tonight, uh, Ken Chapman from uh, Orlando, Florida is with us. How are you doing tonight, Ken? I'm doing good, Jonathan. Looking forward to our study tonight. Now, I want to interrupt real quick before I let you do all the rest of the talking uh, and, and talk about the importance of this study that we're engaged in. In a lot of ways, it's very basic, uh, foundational, almost elementary kind of study, but it is so important for two, at least two reasons. Number one is it helps us to see the story of the Bible for what it is, and that is a story, one long continuous story. It also helps us, and maybe even more importantly, helps us to see the purpose of that story, uh, that it's not just a collection of stories. It's not just one long continuous story. Uh, it's a story of redemption, and so we're seeing all of that, and, and this type of study, I think, is, is essential and, and fundamental in us getting to those points, and so I'm, I've enjoyed our study so far and looking forward to what you've got for us tonight. I think it's a good point. Uh, you know, some people have the uh wrong impression that the Bible is just, you know, a collection of rules uh, or, uh, you know, some kind of simple ethic guide, uh, and that's not what's going on. Now, we're going to see some of that next week, uh, but it's not just a, a list of rules that is this narrative uh, that has, uh, as you said, the point of redemption uh, of mankind. So we'll begin thinking about this tonight uh, as the exodus from Egypt, the fifth period that we're going to be looking at. And we ended last time uh, talking about the patriarchs. We have the 12 tribes down in Egypt because of what happened with Joseph. Joseph acknowledging that it was God who put him in Egypt, not just his brothers. And yeah, they meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. And so the whole family winds up in, in Egypt. And Joseph as the number two guy in Egypt, he saved the world, it, it appears. That's how the story reads. And then you open up to Exodus, and in Exodus chapter uh, 1 at verse 8, you read the phrase, there arose a king in Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, I think the clear implication is not that he didn't have a, an awareness of who Joseph was, uh, that, that would be rather silly. But we have a change in dynastic rulers here. Uh, we're, we're moving from one family of pharaohs to another family of pharaohs. Uh, and so as the political opposition, we have someone who's not going to acknowledge Joseph and what he did. And so he's not going to treat the family with favor. In fact, he's a little bit nervous about how they've grown, about the blessings that they have obviously received. And so he feels the need to uh, keep them under control, to kind of put his thumb on them, uh, to keep them from getting too big and maybe fighting back. And if you think about the political side of this, that, that actually does make some sense if we have the political adversary coming to power. Well, this large contingent of the old uh, political ruler uh, and their supporters, what happens if they get angry and decide to fight back? Uh, that, that could be an issue. And so we understand, we know the story that he puts them to forced labor, and uh, that's not really going to help. He is going to uh, demand that all male children uh, be killed. And we see from the uh, two midwives that that they were not going to do that because they feared God. They weren't going to kill innocent children. And so they kind of made up a, a little bit of a story. Well, the ladies, they're 
whew, they are women. Uh, they, they, they have those babies before we can even get there. And uh, so that wasn't going to happen. And so the, the group of Israelites of Hebrews in Egypt keeps growing and the king is doing everything he can to stop them. And it's not working. That should have been his first clue as to who God was. Uh, the, he, he's going to lose battle after battle after battle. He's going to go like, zero for 15 against the Lord. And this is the first one. He can't even stop them from growing. You know, Jonathan, you have, uh, and correctly, you have up on the screen here, uh, a king who didn't know Joseph, uh, from the comments you've made, you could just as easily put on here, a king who did not know God. Absolutely. Uh, and that's going to become apparent. But but I was thinking as you're talking about this, you know, we studied the life of Joseph as kind of this up and down, this roller coaster. He goes mm -hmm. from being favored son to being hated by his brothers and sold into slavery to his elevation in Potiphar's household, then into prison, and then back up to his position in Pharaoh's kingdom. That up and down continues even after his death. Because oh, yeah. when he died, he was kind of on, on the top. But now... There's a king who didn't know him, didn't remember or respect or care about what he's done. And so Joseph's name goes down again. That's a very but interesting point. At the end of, of this, they're going to take his bones with them. And so there he's he's back up again, <laughs> in a sense. And so you, it's funny that you see that up and down of Joseph's, the trajectory of Joseph's life continuing even after his death. So. And, and that actually kind of, so the next point is we're going to start talking about Moses. Uh, you know, you could really see some, uh, some of the same up and down pattern with Moses as well. Uh, so, so that's kind of an interesting thought. I appreciate that point. Um, so in the midst of all this, the, the, they're trying to kill the children. You see clear echoes of this in the birth of Jesus uh, in Bethlehem, uh, just kind of pointing out again this story, this one long narrative here. And then we're introduced to Moses' parents uh, who fear God. They see this baby boy. They're not going to allow anything to happen to him. So they hide him uh, for some time. And then that interesting story about them putting him in an ark and kind of letting him go down the river. And uh, it just so happens. Uh, now, the, the group here, Ken, uh, the group here at Moody knows that when I use that phrase with that, you know, inflection that I'm talking about the providence of God. It just so happened that the ark landed, uh, you know, close to the daughter of Pharaoh, and uh, she sees this baby, and she has pity on this baby, and she doesn't even follow her father's rule uh, about what's supposed to happen to these young Hebrew male children. Uh, now we know that Miriam, we don't know her name yet, but we know that Miriam was watching from a distance and she pipes up, Hey, you want me to go get one of the Hebrew mothers to, to nurse this child for you? And she, she goes and gets Jochebed to, to, to nurse Moses. And we see God really at work here, nothing miraculous yet. Uh, but God still putting things in place as we see him do regularly throughout scripture. Uh, and, and I don't know, maybe there's something to think about the, the uh, uh, miraculous uh, movements of God and the non-miraculous movements of God be an interesting study in and of itself. And so Moses is, is raised and trained in the uh, Egyptian ways. He is Egyptian royalty for all intents and purposes. Uh, and then we notice that he's obviously been told about his Hebrew background. Uh, so he has kind of the best of both worlds. It's interesting. And this is another theme we see throughout scripture. God always seems to have a man inside the camp of the king. Uh, we see it throughout the, uh, the uh, Babylonian captivity. We see it just regularly throughout time. And Moses looks out one day and he sees a, an Egyptian beating a, a Hebrew and he goes and he defends his Hebrew brother and kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. The next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting him, and he goes out there and, and maybe Moses already has this view of himself as a deliverer. Hey, guys, 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 guys. Hey, we don't need to be fighting with one another. We already have enough fighting going on. And one of them pipes up, who made you a ruler over us? You're going to kill me like you did that guy yesterday. And at that point, you can see Moses like looking around, you know, wait a minute, you knew about that? 
uh, well, word of this, and this is where I, Ken, this is where I wish we had more information. Uh, how did word of this get to Pharaoh? Pharaoh wants to kill him because of this. Uh, what, what all happens here? But Moses knows that Pharaoh hears of it. Moses gets out of there. And uh, so uh, the rest of Moses' story, like, really speeds up there. He meets the Midianite priest. Uh, Jethro is what he's typically uh, known as in the Old Testament. Uh, then uh, he marries. And then next thing you know, we see him at the burning bush. And uh, probably not the best phrase for that because it's not actually burning. Uh, it is a flame. <laughs> but burning bush is in our uh, vernacular. So that's fine. God tells him, I need you to go to uh, Egypt and to, you know, relieve my people there. And Moses gives up three or four excuses. Uh, Who shall I tell them sent me? I am Yahweh. This is when we get really that first uh, emphasis on the name of God. I will be with you. What's funny is God... It doesn't even really acknowledge most of what Moses is saying. He says, go. And he says, I can't. What? How do I do this? And God just says, I'll be with you. Uh, and that's going to be a, a pattern throughout scripture. When we're afraid that we can't do something because of our limitations, our inabilities, uh, God doesn't always address our limitations. He just says, I'll be with you uh, because that's all we need. And so God promises to be with him, and Moses, I guess reluctantly, uh, it's an interesting thing, Ken, uh, Moses reluctantly goes back, but once he assumes the role of leader, he is a leader par excellence. Uh, I mean, he never looks back. He is, he is in it for the long haul. Uh, and, and kind of an interesting thing. All right, before we get to the next point, Ken, what, what do you have on Moses for us? Well, you talk about that reluctance, and, and I guess the best leaders, certainly the best spiritual leaders, are always going to have an element of reluctance. If they're too eager to take that role uh, of, of leadership and control over people, then that's probably not going to turn out well. And so we sometimes beat up Moses for his reluctance, but it probably turned out being a blessing. Uh, that it made him the type of leader, the good type of leader uh, that he was. And this, the story of Moses is just so compelling. It's, I mean, it's, this is a made for Hollywood kind of story. Uh, and Hollywood has, has made this story over and over again. And uh, ruined it. We, yeah. And ruined it. That's how we know what, <laughs> that's how we know what Moses looked like. He looked like Charlton Heston. That's right. Uh, you know, that, that but it, it's, it's, such a compelling story that again, we can just get lost in the theatrics and the story itself. But as you said, we see the, uh, the cogs working in the plan of God, of, of the providence of God, of, of this man who is a foreshadowing of the Savior uh, and of God's design through Joseph, through Abraham, Joseph, and now Moses of selecting this people this people that's going to be the vehicle uh, for the fulfillment of his promises. And so let's, let's make sure that we see that. Don't get us get lost in this beautiful, interesting story, uh, but to see where this story, where, where the train is going here. So, right. So uh, Moses is going to go down to Egypt and uh, things are going to start off on a rather rocky uh, front. Uh, but I, I want to read a passage real quick, just because it is so essential to the Exodus, uh, to the book of Exodus, and that's in Exodus 6, and I want to start at verse 6 here. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, is the, the Hebrew name there, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so we have this wonderful uh, laying out of what God's plan is, what God is doing. It is both backward looking and forward looking as God made promises to Abraham that he is going to keep and, and, and keep these promises or deliver these promises uh, to these people, even in the situation they're in. And it's almost like 
God has allowed the rest of the world a head start. And God is kind of almost putting himself in a negative position to further show what he's capable of. And it, it makes sense. Pharaoh is going to say, I don't know Yahweh. Uh, and the implication being, I don't care to know him either. Uh, who is that that I should listen to him? And M Moses basically winds up saying, oh, you're going to know. Uh, and, and that's going to be kind of the rest of this, that the Israelites Moses and Pharaoh are all fixing to get a first row seat to this amazing show that God is about to put on. Now, for the Israelites, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, for Pharaoh, not so much. He has a negative lesson to learn. The Israelites have a positive lesson to learn. And so what God's going to do is uh, basically pick off the Egyptian pantheon <laughs> one God at a time. Uh, Ken, you know, the war movies where you got the sniper up in the window uh, and he's just finding people and, you know, uh, reloading every, and just picking them off one at a time. That's what God's going to do to these Egyptian gods here or so-called gods. And, and that's an interesting study in and of itself. Obviously, we don't have time for that today. And so God is going to do these things that only God can do. And uh, so we start off with the, the water uh, to blood uh, and the Egyptian magicians. Uh, pop quiz, uh, Ken, what's their names? That's a good question. And I don't remember. You tell us. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. <laughs> you. Got me. Yeah. Uh, Janice and Jambres. There you go. Uh, yeah, is, yeah, no, I, I got I got you on that one. I'll 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 hang my hat on that one. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the name that Paul uses. That it was just kind of the Hebrew tradition of, of the names of those uh Egyptian magicians. They're able to do uh what Moses does here at the first and turn water to blood. It's interesting though, um, I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole, that um it says all the water was turned to blood. So where did they find water to turn to blood? Uh, kind of an interesting point there. The second one was frogs. Uh, all these frogs, and they can, frogs are everywhere. Frogs are everywhere. They're in the bowls, they're in the spoons, they're, they're in the beds. And then it says that the magicians could do that. Well, where did they find a place to bring in more frogs? So there's a little, there's a few thoughts there that Maybe they were trying to hoodwink some people, but then it gets, uh, it, it continues and they can no longer keep up with what Moses is doing. And it's, and it's fascinating that the people of Israel are seeing this. The Egyptians are seeing this. And even the Egyptian people are saying, Ooh, yeah, uh, there's something to this God. Uh, there is something about this God, Yahweh that uh, we don't understand, and he has some power. And it's a, it's a reality that, that, that Pharaoh refuses to accept until the last one. Uh, we, we, you can go through the, the 10 plagues, but we know the last one is the death of the firstborn. We have the connection with the Passover there, the blood on the door uh, as, God, as the, God's angel there passes over the uh, houses of the Hebrews, but in the houses of the Egyptians, there was not a house where there was not someone dead. Uh, and, and that heartbreak there of the 10 plagues destroying Egypt from within. You know, we see a progression in these plagues, don't we? Uh, several levels or layers of, of progression. You talked about the one, the first, the magicians were able to either replicate or seemingly replicate, and then it gets to where they can't do that anymore as, as the kind of the power increases or the clarity increases. Um, and I think you can see a progression of how these plagues are affecting the people. Uh, from just being, a, and I don't mean to understate any of them, but being annoying to truly being an affliction. And then, of course, you would have just the, the stacking on layer of, of how they progressively uh, would wear on you. But when I teach this section, sometimes I, I, I talk about the 10 plagues that in my mind, it's almost the nine plagues plus one. Right. Because that last one stands by itself it in a lot of ways in its severity and the language that is used, the way the Israelites escaped it. Uh, there's just a lot of ways in which that plague is 
in, in a list of its own. Well, and uh, also the memorial that goes with it uh, that's celebrated throughout the the history of or the future uh, of the Israelites. Yeah, yeah, they they don't eat frog legs at the Passover. <laughs> um, it, it's a separate, you know, it, it doesn't incorporate all the plagues. Uh, that one plague is is again in some sense stands by itself. You mean the Cajuns aren't descendants of uh, the? <laughs> <laughs> so um, one thing we see throughout these uh, plagues is um, Pharaoh uh, kind of wavering here and there. A few times he says, "Fine, you can go," and then changes his mind. He he tries to okay, just your men can go, just this group can go, uh, but but he always r- retracts it. Well, here at the end with the final plague, the death of the firstborn, get out, uh, please get out. And so they leave, and then we have this this emphasis on God hardening his heart. Um, it, it that can be a troubling thing until you see that like the first six times the idea of someone hardening their heart, Pharaoh is hardening his own heart. Uh, and then I think it's the, the last six times the phrase is used, it's God, because Pharaoh already made his decision. Uh, God doesn't, you know, knock us over the head and render us unconscious and, and take away our free will. Uh, no, Pharaoh made his decision. So God is going to use Pharaoh's decision. And so the people get out, they're, they're traveling out into the wilderness, and they are approaching the Red Sea, and, Mo, and uh, Pharaoh changes his mind and says, go get them. Why are we going to let our free workforce go? Uh, go get those people and bring them back. And the people see the Red Sea in front of them. They see the Egyptian army behind them, and they are, as we might expect, a little afraid. Uh, but here's the first, Ken, I'm, I'm going to step on some of yours for next time. This is the first time that we see their complete lack of faith. You would think that they've just witnessed these 10 amazing acts, uh, of God, these 10 plagues that, okay, we know we're going to be okay, but they automatically start assuming that God brought us that there's not enough graves in Egypt which is funny because they were known for their burials. Uh, There's not enough. So he brought us out here to kill us out here. And Moses basically says, close your mouth and just watch. Uh, We've seen what God can do. God's going to do something now. And God basically tells Moses, hey, what are you waiting for? Go forward. And they're at this body of water. We could talk about where that is, what's going on there. And the body of water splits. And uh, liberal critical scholars have tried to explain how there might be some kind of natural event to explain this. But the simple fact is the text tells us they walked through on dry land. Uh, and so we see the workings of God here as water is divided. We have almost these walls of water and they walk through the Red Sea and the Egyptians maybe uh, fearfully follow them in. And as soon as the Israelite gets out, God closes it and the Egyptian army is destroyed. And so now God has single-handedly ruined the Egyptian economy, has ruined the uh, financial stability of the people of Egypt as they've given all their stuff to the Israelites and now has taken away the Egyptian army. God has judged the country of Egypt harshly uh, and in doing it saved his people. And this is going to be another theme that we see throughout scripture, the dividing of the Red Sea. We're going to see it in the crossing of the Jordan. We're going to see it in Psalms. We're going to see it in the prophets, this regular uh, kind of ode, this hat tip uh, to the crossing of the Red Sea. And so what we have in the Exodus is God's power on full display. And it's the greatest act of deliverance until the cross. And that passage that I read, chapter six, verses six through eight, it's really interesting because you can go through that and replace the term Egypt with the term sin. 
and we see what God is going to do with Jesus on the cross. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of sin, and I will deliver you from slavery to it, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burden of sin. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so you have this phrase, these verses that are so important for Exodus that are so important for us. It gives you the outline for what God has planned for his people. And that's why it's so amazing to study this as one long story, not just a collection of 66 stories or bits and pieces here and there. We see this one long theme and God's power is on full display. And we would be foolish if we walk away from that, not knowing the Lord as Pharaoh really does. All right, Ken, what you got? Close us out here. Well, we like the, the Israelites have been, as you said, delivered from our bondage in sin. Uh, we've seen in our own lives, not the miraculous power of God, but the, the providential and the redemptive power in God. And on our side here, we need to not do what they did and, and lose sight of that and lose trust in God. God who brought me through that will bring me through other things as well. And so let's learn that lesson of trust or faith and, and not make the mistake that they made in having seen and witnessed the power of God to now forget it and, and get discouraged when times get hard, when the armies of the world are amassed against us and we just think it's is over. Remember God. And, right. and we need to take those lessons, uh, personal lessons as well. Absolutely. So we see God's promise to make these people his people, and we're going to see how God starts making some of that happen uh, next week. They have some uh, they have some alone time out in the wilderness uh, <laughs> to get to know one another. And Ken will discuss that for us uh, next Monday at 630. And we hope that you will join us then.